Hi everyone, I'm Matt Martineau, presenting uh, Using Upstream MPTCP in Linux Systems. Uh, Co-authored this with Osama Othman, also at, at Intel. And uh, let's begin. Um, so to start with, uh, when I originally proposed this talk, uh, we didn't have MPTCP upstream yet. And now um, six months later, we, we do. Um, over 150 commits have been merged this year. Um, and at this point, um, by the time you're viewing this, we'll have Linux 5.8 available with multipath TCP features, including uh, multipath TCP v1, um, the ability to create multiple subflows, um, the ability to manage those subflows with uh, some in kernel functionality, and um, viewing the status of connections with uh, the SS command uh, via INET DIAC. Um, and I also want to point out, while, while uh, Osama and myself are from Intel and uh, did this presentation, the, the upstream effort has very much been a, a collaboration. Um, you know, there's more, more non-Intel people involved than Intel people. So I want to definitely give credit to uh, our fellow community contributors from Red Hat, Tesseris, and Apple, um, and uh, even uh, growing community today more more people becoming involved. And uh, if you're interested in looking at our GitHub project, here's a, a URL with a shortcut to that. Um, and I'll have more, more resources linked later. So um, just to give a, a quick framing for what is multipath TCP, um, some of our, our previous talks have gone into more detail on this, but um, just wanted to give a, a quick view. In this example is a use case where we've got a, a mobile device talking to a server and the mobile device has multiple network interfaces, one Wi-Fi, one cellular, and it's talking to a, a server with a, a public IPv6 address. And so the mobile device has made a, made a connection, created two TCP subflows, which are to the network look like separate TCP streams. Um, the application has just opened one socket. It sends A, B, C, D, and uh, MPTCP in the kernel decided which interfaces to send each uh, packet over. So, um, for example, here on subflow one, it sent A, B, and D, and subflow two, it sent B and D. And then on the receiver side, it uh, uses sequence number information um, at, a, at a layer above TCP to reassemble the stream to present on the uh, streaming socket on the service. So um, it is a protocol, multipath TCP is a protocol that is um, both kind of layered above TCP and also intermingled with it. Um, and so it's not a completely clean separation, but um, it's, it's a lot of aspects of it. You can think of it that way. Um, when, it, when a multipath TCP connection begins, it looks a lot like a normal TCP connection. You, you've got your, you know, SYN, SYNAC, acknowledgement handshakes, but there are additional, there's an additional TCP option sort of uh, along for the ride on that handshake that also is um, allowing each peer to um, consider that connection multipath TCP and uh, add the ability to, to have new subflows later. And that, that's called joining when more TCP um, connections are created inside the kernel and um, added to the parallel streams. So um, when a peer is sending, it can send data on one or more subflows. The receiver will discard the duplicates. Um, if you were, say, watching one of these subflow streams in, you know, Wireshark or TCP dump or, or you know, um, watching the, the connection in the middle over the network, the subflow streams may actually contain data that looks out of order or redundant, but uh, multipath TCP sorts that all out before presenting the stream to the um, client, the, to the application. So uh, multipath TCP does this while the connection is active. Um, also with TCP options, those carry an additional layer of sequence numbers um, to, to reassemble data packets later. And um, also acknowledge that uh, 
things have been reassembled at the level so that they don't need to be resent by the sender. So what's this useful for? Um, there's kind of three categories. One is steering, where the sender can uh, use information it has about what the best network is. Best meaning maybe in some cases lowest latency, best in some cases meaning higher bandwidth. And so it can it can push data over the link that, that works best for it. Um, the switching case where you know, for example, you have both a mobile and a Wi-Fi interface where you might want to um, fall back to using cellular as you leave range of a Wi-Fi network and uh, multipath TCP can handle this failover pretty seamlessly without the application having to change things. And um, also splitting, so the ability to combine the bandwidth of multiple interfaces, um, such as like a hybrid access use case where it could send over both LTE and DSL at the same time. Um, you know, one always on, one for, for peak bandwidth. And uh, multi-path TCP has been um, selected for use in the 5G ATSSS standard for um, access traffic, steering, switching, and splitting to, to handle these various use cases, um, you know, be used by a cellular provider policy carrier policy and things like that. So um, in some ways, multipath TCP has been around a while. The uh, initial experimental RFC was, was published in 2013 um, after a several year drafting process. Um, if you see multipath TCP used uh, in most existing deployments today, it is an implementation of this, this older RFC uh, in March this year, the, the V1, the standards track RFC uh, 8684 was published. And um, that is the version that, that has been included in upstream Linux. Um, the specification was developed to, to fix some of the issues seen in uh, the version zero spec. And um, they, they aren't reverse compatible, but uh, that doesn't doesn't mean you you still have options for uh, interoperation if you have a stack that supports both on one side. So um, this this incompatibility is due to changes in the connection handshake. Um, so the newer one better supports TCP fast open, but um, it, it just flags a different version. So if you have a say a V1 peer initiating a connection to one that only supports the V0, um, the V0 one will see that it, it's not a compatible version and you'll just get a regular TCP connection. Um, now, it is also possible for, say, say, a device that supports both standards to see, oh, they didn't support V1, I can retry with V0, but that would be a, a whole separate handshake. So the, the fallback is a separate um, TCP connection, not, it, it isn't able to switch multipath TCP versions uh, during one connection. Um, the newer multipath, the V1 spec does use um, SHA-256 and um, has some more features for reliable uh, sharing of, of IP address information and um, is available to, is able to do a faster close with TCP reset. So the um, evolution of multipath TCP in the upstream kernel, as I said, we've, we've been active with this throughout 2020 so far. Um, the, the first multipath TCP kernel, Linux kernel version was 5.6, but it, it only supported a, a, a single multipath, well, a single subflow. Um, so it didn't actually have the, the multiple in the, in the multipath um, yet it was just at a released at a phase in the upstreaming where some of the foundational parts were there but not full functionality so 5.7 is where we did add the ability to create multiple subflows and um, control to some degree when those are, are created and accepted and also um, the ability to use the uh, ss command to find out the status of those multiple subflows 
And then uh, as I record this, the upcoming release of 5.8, which should be out by the time the conference happens, um, that will improve uh, performance and reliability of, of multiple subflows and, uh, and through things like better receive window um, handling at the multipath DCP level. So one, um, one thing about upstreaming multipath TCP is, is it's been a, a long road um, and uh, we think we've learned some things that might be helpful to other projects um, that they might be able to learn. Um, so what would be a similar project um, in this context? Um, you've got significant new functionality that, that um, doesn't have a home in the staging tree. Um, you've got both close coupling with existing, you know, critical kernel functionality, like in our case, the TCP stack that we, we very much did not want to break. And um, also possibly modifying that existing kernel subsystem. And, and you've got a team that's distributed across different organizations, different companies. And, you know, this, this is kind of the scope of a, a project that might match up with uh, what MPTCP did. Um, kind of one of the main things we had to consider in something like this is that there's this kind of paradox of, of the maintainers needing to have uh, reviewable pieces of functionality. So, you know, you have to send something initially, but you don't necessarily know what the, the early foundational pieces are until you, you build a, a lot of what you're trying to do. Um, so you kind of have to try to balance the initial patch set contents with, with you know, the investment in the work up front, because uh, you might get feedback that'll sort of uh, cascade through the addition, the, the rest of the project. Um, so some things we learned to, to maybe try to steer away from, um, we, we did try, uh, an initial approach of saying, okay, well, to make multipath TCP work well, we might want to, um, add some more generic capabilities to the TCP stack. Um, in our case, a TCP options framework to add different TCP options that, that weren't hard coded into the, the option handling. Um, so we, we identified some kind of common use cases with MD5 and TCP MD5 and tried to add, add that. And, uh, it was, it was rejected. Um, but the feedback we got from it was good. And, and, and the advice there was to, you know, go ahead and build what we needed for multibath TCP. And then, you know, if we identified an opportunity that, you know, a framework would make things cleaner later, then maybe the later would be the right time to work on that. Um, you don't want to spend a lot of time kind of guessing and going in circles about what containers do and don't want. Um, you know, th there is a balance if they've got, you know, time to spread across all kinds of projects, not just yours, but, you know, seeing code is helpful. RFC patch sets can help, you know, and keeping that balanced, um, you know, not too many that they get sick of you, but, but enough to get the important questions answered is, is a good balance to strike. Um, and, um, you also, you know, maybe don't churn too much on prototype code. I mean, you, you want to get value out of it. You don't want to, um, explore too many ideas that, that aren't, um, contributing to forward progress on the, the upstreaming front. So, um, some, some recommendations for what you want to do to, to get a successful project, um, uh, building community is, is really important. You want to, you want to get the word out early. You want to get on a mailing list where, um, like-minded or, or similarly focused people, um, you know, net dev list or, or other things would be listening and, and might have common interests, um, proposing a conference talk like this one, um, gets, gets a lot of, uh, attention too. And you may be surprised at who gets involved or, or, um, supports the project and, um, that's a good way to go. Um, you'll, you'll want to have a team that, that has people in a whole bunch of different roles. Um, you know, 
probably the initial focus will be from, um, you know, people who are interested in the technology or are experts already. Um, but it's it's also very important, especially in in the um, context of having changes to an existing complicated and uh, very performance sensitive system. You want you want people who know that inside and out, um, and that that uh, was something that our initial team didn't have. And then once we got that, it, it was we were able to make progress a lot faster. Um, you want to have people who are, are fulfilling a communication role of you know, doing doing a conference presentation, doing uh, the, the meeting logistics, that kind of thing. Um, and also um, having having automation available to keep things on track with builds and, and uh, sharing test results and making sure everybody's all on the same page. Um, we've had a lot of luck with uh, weekly online meetings. We're spread over different countries. Um, and uh, but it, it's been a regular helpful thing for strengthening our community and, and staying accountable to each other. Um, and, you know, when, when everybody's able to travel again, um, face to face meetings really, really help. Um, we had also some uh, just kind of a grab bag of tips here. We, we use Topkit for revising patch sets and, and rebasing on NetDev. Um, use a variety of communication technologies and, uh, and continuous integration to, to stay on top of test results and make sure you're not breaking your own code or, or other code. This is also super helpful. And um, if, just a, a final slide on, on the upstreaming process. Um, what we ended up doing, you know, after, after learning a lesson on what didn't work, um, we kind of split things up into four phases. Um, the first was the you know, upstream's uh, independent building blocks. An example of this is SKBX that uh, Florian Westfall upstreamed. And, and this refactored a couple systems and made um, a positive change to those that, that it was accepted on its own. And then that was available for multipath to use as well. Um, and then after that, we, can, we had the next three phases where, where we had built significant functionality out of tree, um, um, all the way up through the multiple subflow capability. But in order to have reviewable patch sets, we, we split that into three pieces. Um, the first was prerequisite changes that, that focused on, um, kind of the, the points where TCP was changing, um, that we wanted to have the maintainers take a close look at before um, proceeding with merges um, and, and, you know, establishing things like uh, user interface, uh, user space interface values, um, IP proto and PTCP, things like that, that just needed to get established up front. Uh, the next step from there, once that was merged, was the sort of uh, the next chunk of foundational code that was of, of reviewable, reviewable size for us. That was a single subflow multipath TCP. Um, not super useful on its own, but but it, it built it brought in a lot of the code that that we needed to to continue building on. And so, um, you know, it's not it's not broken. It's there. It, it does its thing. It's it's solid code, but it um, is not the the real first step that we wanted, and that and that gets us to uh, the multiple subflow number four on this slide, where we added um, the ability to create those multiple subflows and kind of have that baseline functionality we're aiming for. Um, and so, the advice we got was to stick to you know twelve to twenty, hopefully closer to the twelve patches per patch set, and to keep things uh, and of a reviewable size, and, and of course the individual patches being reasonable too. So, um, what needs to happen on a on a Linux distribution or, or you know configuring your own machine to be able to use multipath TCP? The first step in that is uh, making sure it's built into your kernel um, by you know, if you do a, a def config, it's it's not there. Um, so you need to enable config mptcp and, and probably IPv6 as well. Uh, keeping in mind that the the IPv6 support in multipath TCP does prevent use of IPv6 as a module. 
Um, and if you're a developer trying to run the MPTCP self test, there, there are a couple other options that, that we use to um, implement the, the self test support in multiple namespaces. So you've got a kernel with multipath TCP supported. Now, um, wow, your, your applications make use of it. Um, so it's just when you create your socket instead of uh, IP proto TCP or, or just leaving it to default based on the uh, streaming type, uh, you specify IP proto MP TCP. And um, then after that initial socket call, the normal, you know, connect or bind, listen, accept kind of cycle, sending and receiving data with send to receive function, that all works like you're used to with a, a regular stream socket. Um, there's some, some important things to note that are different from TCP. Um, you don't have advanced features like zero copy, um, you know, ULP using kernel TLS, that, that, that stuff isn't there. Um, and if you're, you're using socket options on the socket, that's going to require some extra attention as well. There's uh, several things about supporting socket options with multipath TCP that uh, aren't trivial. It's, it's not possible to just pass things through in all cases to the subflows. Um, there is the issue that, that individual TCP connections that, that are under control of the MPTCP socket, those, those can be added and removed as time goes on. So you have things to think about like, does, does this setting get remembered and applied to new, new connections, new TCP connections, or, or do the new ones have defaults again? Um, and you might have multiple subflows and, and setting one socket option, the value there might not make sense across all of them. Or if you're getting a value, you, do, do you somehow combine the multiple subflow um, socket option values that you've read from those individual ones? Um, or, or do you prefer one, the one that's currently active? There's, so there's just a lot of questions like that. And so um, we, we don't have those implemented yet for the most part. The ones that aren't supported will, will give uh, an error a not supported error, but um, as time goes on, we're, we're going to pick out the ones that are needed most and um, make those work well so, so that programs using TCP sockets don't have to make too many changes um, in their socket option usage in order to uh, leverage multipath TCP. So um, the ones that aren't supported right now are the ones under the, that you would use IP proto TCP to set. Um, and even the, the saw socket options in, in kernels 5.8 and earlier, uh, SO reuse port and reuse adder, um, won't to give the expected behavior, but, uh, in 5.9, we do have a fix for that coming up. Um, and, and we, we are looking at ways to have more, more control of multipath TCP itself via socket options. So an application could have some some more input on um, subflow information, uh, setting up subflows, changing their configuration while running. So um, that, that's the individual programs configuring a socket. Now, another thing to consider is uh, system level runtime configuration. Um, there is a, a syscontrol uh, at MPTCP enabled that, that is turned on by default, um, but you can turn it off per namespace if you don't want multipath TCP to get used. Um, so by default in a, in a kernel that supports multipath TCP, it won't create those additional subflows um, unless you take some specific configuration steps at runtime. So you need, you need to tell multipath, the multipath TCP system that, okay, here's how many subflows I want to allow. Um, and that will have a couple of different ways to, to be addressed. Uh, long-term, um, devices will be able to have a, a user space component that, that controls subflow establishment, such as, uh, multipath TCPD or something else. Um, right now we use the, uh, IP MPTCP command. This is in IP route two, a recent versions, um, 
corresponding to the kernel version 5.7 and later. And um, these, these just configure system-wide behavior. Um, so how this IP MPTCP command works, um, uh, obviously you can refer to the man page, but the, the, the simple cases um, mentioned here, um, one is like if you have say a server that is uh, has a has a public IP address and you just want to let a peer be in charge of initiating more subflows, you can set a limit that controls how many of those requests you will accept per connection, um, and that's this sudo IP MPTCP limit set subflow command. Um, so if like this is set to four, then you get four additional subflows. Um, before it starts limiting. Um, now you can also um, initiate more subflows from today's Linux kernels. And this is with the IP MPTCP limit set subflow command, which, which again lets you set a number of subflows that this kernel will, will try to initiate to the peer. And an additional thing that needs to take place is um, telling telling Multipath TCP which uh, local interfaces you want to use for this additional subflow, including like, especially implied by the um, the local IP address on that interface. So the IP MPTCP endpoint command, you can add multiple endpoints to say use these addresses um, in form optionally inform the other side that, that they're available. And then um, when creating more TCP connections for those TCP subflows, um, use those as a source address. Now, an example of this is um, if you have a, you know, a, a device possibly with interfaces behind that that are, that are trying to connect to a server, um, this would allow you to create those multiple subflows and take advantage of those. So um, I've mentioned path management and doing so in user space. So this, this is the, sort of the terminology for um, controlling which subflows are part of an individual multipath TCP connection. Um, so you can either do this in user space or inside the kernel. Um, there's some advantages to being in user space. Um, it'll be easier to integrate with like platform middleware on mobile devices or carrier policy, things like that. Um, it keeps, keeps the logic for this and the ability to customize it separate from the kernel so that it's um, easier to manage separately, you know, as the kernel's up, updated. Um, and also if, you know, any bugs in, in a path manager don't don't affect system stability so much. Um, and the, one of the other main reasons to, to look at a user space path manager is that on a, say a server use case where servers under heavy load, the, the NetLake interface up to user space could, could become a bottleneck. And so if there are simple criteria that can be in the kernel, that, that can be helpful. Um, as is showing on this slide with the, having an in-kernel path manager, um, it accommodates that server-side use case uh, pretty well because you don't have that overhead. Um, and like I mentioned on the previous slide, the, the maintenance and, and bugs are potentially a bigger issue. And then, then the, that uh, it is more amenable to kind of a global policy that doesn't take as much into account of the characteristics of an individual connection. Um, so, as I mentioned, the connection between the kernel and user space is um, is via a generic Netlink API, and this this allows the kernel to inform user space of events that happen, such as there's there's a new connection or a new subflow or a subflow went away, things like that. And then um, the the daemon, the user space daemon, can can take that and um, issue commands that that change. A behavior with those subflows. Um, this API is uh, in the, the user API Linux mptc.h file and um, is available for use by anything with the, the right privileges. Um, so so it's perhaps someday could be included in Network Manager or we could conman things like that. But um, 
those those don't support MPTCP today. Um, what we went with for an initial implementation using this Netlink interface is to create the multipath TCP daemon, a, a independent daemon that that talks to the Netlink interface and monitors network uh, interface changes. Um, this is extensible with with plugins to to implement different techniques for for creating subflows and allowing those connections. Um, it is it's not a replacement for things like Network Manager, um, but we just we wanted to have an implementation that would work across a variety of use cases that was kind of uh, system agnostic in, in terms of what what a, a distribution or what her uh, mobile platform was built around. Um, and so it it receives those events and and to, you know we're working on functionality today that allows it to configure the in kernel uh, manager uh, path manager, but um, you're still still working towards having upstream functionality that, that has the full set of events and commands to do user space um, path management. And uh, we have a GitHub project for here uh, at github.com intel mptcpd. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, multipath tcpd has plugins um, that uh, we've got a series of headers for showing the interface there are example plugins in the in the source code to show how to how to do this um, and and they the the plugins also communicate with the mptcpd library to be able to um, exert control over over what happens and and then the uh, the, the core daemon itself does the netlink communication to propagate that information so you know, as an illustration here, over the life cycle of a connection, you'd, you'd start a connection. It would both create the, the behavior on the network, sending SYN packets, doing the handshake, and also propagating events to the, the path manager that um, allow it to, to further control um, additional subflow getting established. So um, after, after a, a new connection event comes to the path manager, it, it also gets notified of each new subflow and um, can update its stored data and, and control its own logic for how things proceed from there. Um, and in addition, there's this uh, the the network interface side of things where real time where the the um, generic netlink updates for a new interface also trigger events and can then be used to to send new IP address information to the peer so that it could choose to, to initiate subflows if it wants. And just to uh, close up on the multipath TCP daemon, um, it requires cap net admin for, for using the Netlink interface like any um, Netlink client would have to for, for network stuff. Um, it builds with some systemd integration if that's detected and uses dynamic user support to, to help with the security situation um, and is configured with a, a configuration file. And like it's, and also, as I mentioned earlier, having a uh, reference plugin that, that will do a fairly simple use case of creating subflows, um, one per interface to, to take advantage of those parallel capabilities. So um, in closing today, programs can begin using IP Proto MPTCP, and um, that's with uh, 5.7 kernel and later, and especially with 5.8 and later, you're ready for like, handover based use cases um, with, with the version one of the protocol. And um, in the future, as, as we uh, fill out the, the Netlink API on the upstream kernel, user space path managers will, will add even richer functionality on the, the path manager front. So, and we also are um, busy with a whole bunch of other um, tasks to, to make multipath TCP work as well as possible and, and support a number of advanced features in the future. So if you'd like to find us, um, our project page is at GitHub. We have an active mailing list, mbdcp at list.01.org and, uh, and we're on IRC. Um, feel free to contact me or Osama about these projects.
Um, I'm not going to read all the links to you, but if you are interested in more detail on what multipath TCP does or steps along our upstreaming um, effort, you can refer to these. Um, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, I, I, I'll say this, like I was very skeptical of MPTCP, but I've come to really like what you guys have done. And, and actually, you know, it's an, I find MPTCP as, uh, uh, as a manifestation of, we can keep making TCP better. I mean, it's widely used. Uh, there are things that can be added to it and requires uh, community effort, as you said. Uh, quite a few questions. So uh, question number one, can Wireshark reassemble the MPTCP stream already? I guess, are there dissectors for it? Well, yeah, there is there is a Wireshark dissector. Um, as far as I know, I don't think it puts things together across multiple streams, um, but it, it does show you each individual subflow and you know, that, that recognizes that MPTCP is in use and um, you know shows all the headers and stuff. Awesome. Uh... Are the stream, another next question is, are the streams blocking in your example, I guess, if we lose packets from stream B, will we have to retransmit everything that should come after on all the other streams? Yeah, it, um, so if you lose packets on stream B, so it's um, the MPTCP level acknowledgement is, is, you know, it's not like selective act or anything. It's just how far has it made it. And so, um, it it will in the sense if if something hasn't been acknowledged the sender will will resend on other streams but the uh, the receiver you know still has all the data from um, whatever it's received on on other streams that we're moving forward and so it can uh, you know as soon as it's able to move that act forward based on buffer data it can but you know there still might be more in flight than really needs to be But, but the idea is that the ACK is at the MPTCP lev stream level, right? So right. at the MP, MP level, you already know what has been acknowledged and what hasn't been acknowledged. So you don't have to globally take uh, corrective action. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure on the answer to that question. I mean, each subflow is still is a is a TCP stream oh, that, that right. you know, has been uh, reassembled and you know, any retransmissions have happened there. So pretty much if you were, if you're blocked by, you know, something that was sent on one stream, you know, that, that one, like you're going out of Wi-Fi range and you're just not getting anything on that stream mm -hmm. anymore. Um, you will, you know, just de depend on, on the sender starting, starting over from whatever wasn't hacked and you know, there, there can be different approaches. That, so it's called a, a scheduler at the MPTCP level where it decides which which data is going out on which subflow. And so, you know, you can have schedules with, with different strategies where if you had a re retransmitted data, um, you could infer, you know, which one it was blocked on and know, know which data was kind of stuck behind that on that flow and only retransmit that. Makes sense. Um, sorry, I missed this. Tom, you have your hand raised. Uh, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Okay, while well, Tom is answering that, we'll continue. Uh, what's still missing? Yeah, I did have the slide later in the, in the list yeah. about that. Um, so a lot of them are things addressing you know how we, how you would make good use of mptcp on on say a mobile phone or something so we kind of started from the server use cases of okay something else is responsible for initiating multiple subflows the peer is going to handle that and we just have to decide whether to accept those connections or not so um, the main things we have going are um, you know supporting the side that that is making use of those multiple interfaces and um, you know the, like the user space path management to 
uh, take a more active role in, in looking at which interfaces are available, when to announce those to the peer, which, which mm -hmm. ones to prefer in different uh, scenarios, that kind of thing. Um, let's see what else is on that slide. Um, uh, just re refining um, the performance, um, making it more configurable, how, how outgoing data is, which, which subflows are chosen for that, the, the packet schedulers. Um, I think there's some things kind of in the pipeline for um, SYN cookies. And um, there are some things in the RFC that are kind of, you know, should uh, implement or, or things like that to just, uh, you know, dot all the I's and cross the T's. Good. Uh, continuing. Uh, I'm wondering if, next question, I'm wondering if there's a real life example of TCP fast open usage. Um, I don't have one on the top of my head. It's been uh, some other community members that have been more active on that. So, I, I mean, I do know that, like, um, we do have a community member from Apple who has probably one of the, probably the biggest MVTC deployment in the world that they they use for Siri. Um, mm -hmm. And he's, he's been very knowledgeable about TCP fast open and, and helping that happen. So that's, that's all I know on that front. Okay, continuing uh, uh, the same question and uh, what features functionalities are missing. So we'll skip that. How is MPTCP better than quick slash HTTP three and is there HTTP support for MPTCP? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think MPTCP and Quick each have their kind of benefits and drawbacks. I mean, I, I think the main thing about multipath TCP is that it it is TCP, um, and in in terms of dealing with firewalls and things, it's going to be handled that way. Um, it does, you know, the the way it uses option headers um, can lead to problems with some middle boxes. Um, so, you know, that's a trade off in the other direction. But um, I think kind of kind of the main way I think of it is that if you know, if you've got things using a streaming socket today, you know, at the, the user API level in Linux, then, you know, they just deal with that, a very similar socket mm -hmm. um, to, to make use of multipath TCP or, or, um, I guess this is one other thing that's kind of uh, in terms of future work, like um, we're talking about using a, um, a BPF hook on the, the socket call to be able to configure like per C group to just say, well, oh, you requested TCP. Well, we're, we're just going to switch that over to MPTCP in the kernel and not have to make any changes to your program binary at all. Um, HTTP support for MPTCP, it's it's just, it's at a lower level. It, yeah. It, yeah, it, it's HTTP hooks up to the stream and whether that gets split across multiple subflows is, is transparent. So there was a second part where I should have read that. I guess how many kernel level sockets are there? Is it one per user visible MPTCP and one for each subflow, TCP subflow, or is there some other number? That's yeah, that's exactly it. So you, when when a socket is created, it creates uh, an MPTCP level socket that is the one facing user space, and then um, for the initial connection, that creates an underlying regular TCP socket, um, which you know, being in the kernel, it can do uh, different things with to uh, kind of hijack that for for multipath purposes and, and customize it. Um, because there are some differences in the TCP semantics of a, a subflow versus a regular TCP connection. Um, so I'm going to read the next two together because I think uh, they're kind of related, or at least I think they are. Is MPTCP something like a reverse proxy for TCP connections to multiple interfaces? And the next one is how does one load balance MPTCP? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I guess. I haven't really thought about it as a reverse proxy before, just in, because everything's so, you know, the endpoints are kind of in control of the, um, 
establishment and approval of those those different subflows. There are, I mean, well, I think one way that multipath TCP is used in in practice today is with um, you know proxies that handle multipath TCP you know on the public facing IP side, and then that just that gets proxy to a regular TCP connection that then then the servers themselves are only dealing with regular TCP flows. Um, there, I, I think there has been, you know, there's like research papers and things on load balancing and um, I don't know much about the details, but it does, does certainly complicate like the example in the chat of uh, the load balancer not seeing return traffic. It, it's, there would have to be communication of a bunch of multipath TCP state between the, the proxy and the server. And um, I'm not aware of anyone having implemented that. I'm going to inject interject on that question just a little bit. I mean, currently, uh, my understanding is that your the sub the distribution to the subflows is sort of a round robin model, right? Or or sort of efficiency um, of the connection model. Right now, yeah. Right now, it's pretty simple. Where where it just um, kind of there there's. There are kind of there are two priority levels for a subflow. They can be designated a backup flow, mm -hmm. or, or just a regular one. Yep. And so right now, when uh, you're transmitting, it'll just if if there are more than one non-backup flows, it'll just try to use whatever's there. It'll you know, push as much data as it can, and then if there's buffer space available on another one, it'll try to send there. And then if uh, it'll ignore the backup flows in that scenario, unless there's only backup flows, in which case it will distribute among those. Right. So I, I think uh, so. That was my point. That maybe that's that's an area where the you could come up with a more than just you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's policy. so so. There's a an out of tree kernel that that has been <laughs> in wider use that that does. Um, it has kernel modules for packet schedulers. And so we're kind of our plan is to, you know, try to do something BPF based to, to allow that to be customized. Makes sense. Uh, so, uh, I think there was a follow on comment that note that high bandwidth load balancers do not see return traffic. It's a direct return. Yeah. Um, fair, but I think in this case, it wouldn't really matter. Right? It's a source based load balancing. Um, question, what about eBPF based path management? I've seen some patches, I've seen some patches posted these days to the MPTCP list. Yeah, the current round of eBPF patches, those are, that's, um, that's an effort to um, support use of socket options on, on the subflows um, configuration through eBPF. It's not related to path management right now. Is, is that a sufficient answer? If there's a follow-up, please, please speak up. Uh, another question, what is the CP overhead with respect to MPTCP? Is the MPTCP checksum normally disabled to reduce CPU overhead? Um, so today, what's what's in kernel, well, any of the any of the upstream kernels, we, we don't support the MPTCP checksum right now. Um, it's always disabled. And I, I, we talked about, in, you know, having that option available in the future, but haven't haven't built that yet. Okay. Uh, next question: Can we mix v4 and v6 streams? Um, yeah, multipath TCP. It does. That that's part of the assumption is that you can, when you advertise additional addresses that are available, they can be. A mix of v4 and v6. Uh, actually, that's an interesting question. So that you, you, what, you, if I understood that right, what you're saying is the user socket, the user facing socket could be a v4 socket, but you could be striping over a v4 and a v6 subflow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, given MPTCPD, and kernel and IP commands, can MPTCP work with an unmodified application? Example, can SSH, SSHD 
uh, or like SSH or SSHD, or does every application need to be adjusted for even basic use? Yeah, so there's, um, I think, you know, I mean, there's always the kind of LD preload approach of um, hijacking the, the socket call and, and substituting the thing there. Um, and I think some people have been using that for testing purposes, but um, pretty much that and the, the C group thing I mentioned earlier of, of extending, adding a C group BPF hook for the socket call could uh, enable that in a way too. Um, and like the, uh, the out of tree kernel that I mentioned that um, has older support for MPTCP, that, that one, just every socket was an MPTCP socket, but they also, um, they didn't have, so there was that question earlier about having, how many sockets are created in the kernel. <laughs> um, and so we didn't, want to go the route of taking over every TCP connection because you do always have that kind of intermediary um, MPTCP socket talking to a lower level TCP socket that, you know, it is it is a more resource intensive thing than a regular TCP connection. But um, that said, I think there, there are also people who like, well, you know, we could add a sys, sys control <laughs> to just say always use TCP or always use TCP for um, listening connections or as opposed to outgoing or, or things like that. Uh, well, the, the question set keeps growing. Um, yeah. Good for us, we have time. So we, we'll keep rolling with this for a while. Uh, how does it work with net filters, firewalls, etc.? cetera? Um, well, I mean, in terms of firewalls, it's gonna just show up as separate TCP flows. Um, I don't know the net filter details, although I mean. I, I guess you just need to have policies adopt the subflows, right? Because that's the real problem. If I was you know, blocking an IP address and all the traffic came in on a subflow IP address, then I have to make sure that all my policies translate to whatever the subflows that are applicable are. Yeah. Um, there's a question about LD preload. I think we, we covered that. Um, thank you for the lightning talk. BPF, of course, there's a question from Tom, but it's, um, oh, well, Tom's question comes later. Um, so since Tom reserved the spot, we'll ask his question first, Jamal. You, know? you see what Tom did there? Uh, MPTCP proxies are an oxymoron. What are the prospects of deploying this so we can eliminate these abominations? <laughs> um, I'm, I don't know, Tom. <laughs> Uh, Tom, okay. you should speak more. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's a little bit of a, uh, a loaded question. Um, so the, these uh, multi-path TCP proxies came up in IETF, and <clears throat> they're like, oh, we need this as a stopgap because uh, either the server side or the client side doesn't support them. And I looked at that and I said, okay, if you're going to call something a stopgap, you need to show that you, there's a plan to close it. And they didn't have that plan. So like anything else, if you start deploying this, then it, it's, it's gonna be there forever. Um, but the, the, the obvious problem here is it multi-path and yet forces us to go through a single point in the network. So it kind of undermines the whole point of, of multi-path. So, so let, me, let me preface this by, by saying, first of all, I think this work was great. And you know, kudos to the team for the persistence. I know this was a really hard patch to get in the kernel. Um, you guys stuck with it, and you know, I think that's absolutely fantastic. It is a, it is a very good case study for how to get something complex um, into into the kernel. So it should uh, should be used as that. But now that it's in, where do we go? So who who really needs to get this into deployment, and how quickly can we get? So maybe it's not so much. Uh, uh, question for this, but you know, I'm thinking, um, is and can Android pick this up quickly, uh, and then can we can we get the server guys, uh, Google, Facebook, or whatever, to pick this up quickly too, um, with the intent of, of trying to preclude this complete uh, universal deployment of, of multi-path proxies. 
So I don't know if that's, it's more of a philosophical question, I guess, but um, if you have any short-term ideas how to influence deployment, that would be good. Yeah. Um, well, I do know, so as far as an Android type of use case goes, that I think is where we're still working on some of those client side features of, for, especially for path management and uh, like probably some lower level stuff about managing uh, specific interfaces and, and data flowing to those. Um, I pasted a link in the chat of, uh, so Red Hat just published a, a information about a tech preview um, for um, their um, support of uh, this in their enterprise Linux. So um, they're working on that from the, the server side too. Um, well, it's going to be the client side that's going to be the harder one to get in, right? Like, right, right. Um, um, but there are, you know, there are, you know, a very large number of uh, MPTCPs supporting clients out there. They're just not running Linux. <laughs> um, so, and they're not running multipath TCP version one yet. Okay. Um, I, I see Jamal tried Don's trick, but his question came in a little later. But uh, Jamal says, can you inject your own flow scheduling algorithm, maybe using eBPF at the socket level and build cool load balancers there? Yeah, that's the, the plan to be able to do that, but not yet. I mean, nothing, nothing in the pipeline prevents you, right? Because by the time your egress eBPF runs, it's just a TCP flow. You, well, you can... um, so so it's this multipath TCP socket that sits above the, the TCP subflows that, that actually decides which which subflow socket to that's, that's... transmit on. Um, so it that there's a decision happening at that level that that yeah, we're talking about using EPPF to determine which subflow socket it goes to. Makes sense. Will middle boxes like uh, cellular PEPs uh, usually drop MPTCP options? It's a very good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, from from what I've heard from large deployments, that that uh, it's a fairly large percentage of uh, of connections that succeed. So so multipath TCP at connection time, if it senses a, a middle box messing around with the uh, the MPTCP options, it'll it'll just succeed as a TCP connection, and they keep stats on that. and And it's still, I can't remember if it's in in the ninety percent range um, of of things succeeding. So it's uh, since it is widely used on a popular mobile platform, I think a, a lot of that has been straightened out. I see. But, but uh, you don't know of any places where the the SYN options or the options in the SYN is, has been dropped and MPTCP therefore could not work? Um, I, not not specific ones. I mean, I know that the middle box problems do, do crop up and that I... I yeah. but the, I the there's, there's been a bunch of studies which showed it's pretty safe most of the time. Yeah, I mean, we know middle boxes exist to create problems, but uh, <laughs> this one might be safe. Um, okay, uh, Jamal, you had a follow up on your comment, which is now you can do le clever load balancing by using Netlink APIs, which I think is your user space solution. Right? Yeah, I was wondering if you just listen to the Netlink events and consult your user space scheduling algorithm and then decide where which uh, interface that subflow should go to. And that way you achieve your own home cooked uh, load balancer, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so hey. there are two two questions which again I think are related in some sense. Uh, question about does contract work on a PTCP? And the second is how could you could you use different congestion control managers per subflow as in cubic on one and BBR on the other? 
Um, yeah, I don't. I, I haven't tried anything with contract. Um, so I, I'm. I think there's people in the community who can answer that better than me. Um, so if yeah, yeah, if you want to find us on IRC or our mailing list, I, I think we could get an answer for you. Um, for the different congestion controllers, yeah, our, our main limitation there right now is just the like the the user space doesn't have a way to direct a um, you know configuration to one specific subflow. But um, it's certainly yeah that since the subflows are each independent TCP connections, they they can be independently configured um, for congestion control. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, Alex asks, I seems I missed an answer. How is MPTCP better than Quick HTTP three? We covered that, right? And is that HTTP support for MPTCP? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, definitely there is HTTP support to to repeat that one, and and there. Yeah, I think there's this. Yeah, I don't want to rehash on the, the trade-offs. Yeah. Um, Jamal saying SD-WAN would be a good use case. Uh, this is really cool, good talk. I, I, I second that. I just don't see how this is usable on a large scale server farm with TCMP and four way, four tuple hash, hashing load balances, which are two levels of flow balancing, which will hash subflows to different and servers for actual TCP termination. Yeah, um, I, I think it would require some different approaches. I don't, I don't have anything specific to suggest on that. Uh, how would retransmit work for loss in one subflow? Will we covered this one as well, right? Will it be transmitted in the same subflow? Okay, now this is a spin on it. Will it be retransmitted in the same subflow, different subflow, or in a multi subflow? Yeah, so the, the MPTCP level retransmission, that pretty much happens when like one subflow. So if, if a piece of data was only transmitted on one subflow, um, that if that's not moving forward, then, you know, it's, it, wouldn't it would be you know stuck on the, the transmit side it wouldn't have any you know wouldn't be able to push anything else into the buffer so it would it would end up going somewhere else um, I mean there's room there for more smarts on keeping track of which data went on which subflow and um, optimizing that a bit but it yeah it will um, typically go to a different different subflow which is the Kind of the purpose of having the multiple ones. So. Uh, somebody answered one of the questions. One of the benefits of Quick for HTTP is that it's per stream flow, so there is no header flow blocking. Doesn't sound like HTTP over MPTCP will get that. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate. Uh, question: The tutorial on the website is from 2013. Is it still valid? Does it still work? Oh yeah, that. Um... That, you t that tutorial applies to the um, the out of out of tree kernel, um, which which is different in terms of how it handles um, user space APIs. You know, like I said, it takes over every TCP connection and um, handles path management and scheduling and things differently. So just be aware of that when you're looking up multipath TCP for Linux at the the upstream side versus the, the stuff at multipathtcp.org. I mean, we have a lot of overlap in the teams even, but um, we, di we did make different decisions because that, that the out of tree kernel was, you know, a test bed for the protocol and, and kind of had the approach of trying to look at it from the perspective of, okay, we're just going to take over every TCP connection and add this capability versus with upstream, um, we had different set of trade-offs in order to, to get it upstream and, and work the way that the, the maintainers are comfortable with. Uh, 
I think we might be done. Yeah, I think we caught up. Woohoo. All right. Well, thank you once again. It was a good talk. Clearly, lots of interest yeah. and clearly an area that has been that's taken years and, uh, and a lot of effort, but I think the end result is actually something very, very valuable.